guys i'm really happy to do another black manta bmcp live a uh, short introduction uh, my name is jürgen and i'm welcoming you to today's bmcp live our topic today will be how security tokens are revolutionizing startup and company financing and before we start i would like to give you some house rules so uh, as you have seen, we are using the webinar function of Zoom. So I would like to suggest you, if you have a question uh, directly to Beckmanta, for example, you can put it into the chat. Uh, if you have a question which is related to the panel, I would like to say to you that you're putting it up in the Q&A function. And uh, before we start, uh, Alex from Black Manta will give us a short introduction. And after that, uh, every one of the panelists will have like one minute to give a short idea who they are and present uh, what, they're, uh, uh, what, what they are doing basically in that field. So Alex, uh, I would like to hand over the word to you. Could you give us a little bit of uh, introduction? Yes, uh, thank you, Jürgen. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to thank all the panelists, Sorcha, Toby, Robert, Florian, for joining us today, and Jürgen for moderating again. This is the fourth edition or third edition of this webinar. We started this session during the COVID crisis and it's a lot of fun and it, we are allowed to speak to a lot of uh, other great people. Um, <clears throat> my name is Alexander. I'm co-founder and uh, managing partner at Black Matter Capital Partners. We are a tokenization as a service provider regulated by the German Financial Market Authority called BaFin. Thus, we are um, allowed to provide corporate finance services using blockchain technology as a broker dealer. Today's topic, uh, as Jürgen said, is about how tokenization may, can, or will um, have a big impact on the startup scene or on SME financing in general. And therefore, uh, thank you again for joining, also to all of our viewers. And now I'd like to uh, give more of the words to Sorcha um, for introducing herself. Perfect. So over to me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be speaking here with Black Manta and indeed this team of innovators. Um, so I'm looking at the bigger picture of where security token offerings fit into the economy and global economies from top down and bottom up. And that's where I spend my time at the moment. Um, STOs plus what? Plus sustainable development goals, SDGs, environmental social governments investments, ESGs, pensions, public infrastructure and procurement products, as well as funds raised for SMEs and startups. The most common theme I find across the blockchain and crypto space is the tribalism, which can stagnate interoperability. The tech must fit a problem within a system of problems I think we all recognize. So SDOs have to be designed to support or enhance other vehicles, instruments, and technologies like banks, products, matrix of pension, savings, insurance, loans, et cetera. And thinking ahead for SMEs and startups, how will STOs interact with CBDCs, stable coins, crypto digital assets, and wider blockchain protocols, as well as non-blockchain for funding and reporting? Uh, so I'm interested to hear what's been going on with the panel and uh, how we can build products together. Thank you very much, Sorcha, for a short introduction. Uh, I would <laughs> short like to like keep it. No, it's perfect. Like, you know, like uh, as I was saying in the beginning, and uh, I would like to hand over to Florian. And maybe you could give us a little bit of an idea of who we are and what you are doing. Sure. Thanks for inviting me to the panel. Um, I come from the compliance side when it comes to crypto assets. So I'm a CEO and co-founder of Blockpit. We're providing um, compliance solutions for digital assets, mainly for tax optimization, anti-money laundering. And we also used the instrument of the security token for fundraising in the startup. So we issued the first security token on our Austrian law last year, successfully raising $2 million. Um, so had a, a, a harsh time getting that through, but I think we, we set a, a little milestone for all the others that are now coming behind us. Um, and happy to talk about uh, what we did and, and how we basically got through all of this. Perfect, thank you very much. And uh, from the person who was doing a red in STO, I would like to hand over to Robert, which will do an STO. 
Thanks very much indeed um, for having me, um, Logan and Alex. Um, so um, yeah, we're doing an, an STO on Black Manta as we speak for Blockchain Company Limited. And um, so what are we? Um, so we are um, a startup that raised 2.5 million um, between 2017 and 2018. And our goal basically very simply is to build the next generation of Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, if you like, um, on the blockchain and um, with respect to data and the ability to actually give, um, you know, consumers, the 7.5 billion people, access to our utility platforms through the token. So um, we basically have built a number of platforms platforms assets in MVP stage already with the funding that we've raised and we're very excited about that. Another very interesting thing that's going on is, is that we've been working very closely with the um, French SEC which is called the AMF. They are the first G7 country in the world to actually have a regulated um, framework for ICOs, if you like. So, um, and one of our assets will be going through that. So right now, what we're doing is we're giving investors an opportunity to come in in this very early stage before we get to that next um, utility um, token ICO stage. And in this stage, it will give investors exits through the security token. So that's something that we're very excited about and the opportunity that um, lots of other assets would be able to use security tokens as well way to actually get other people involved. Thank you very much, Robert. And I would like to hand over to Toby, which I consider as the most trained guy in the financial world on this panel, if I'm correct. So could you give us a little bit of an introduction of yourself? Very, very good, Jürgen. So, so yes, yeah, so I'm Toby Lewis. I run Novum Insights. We're a research firm of blockchain, AI, fintech, other frontier technologies. Um, so we provide intelligence to venture capitalists, corporates, financial services, groups in everything that's going on within this area. Um, we did a really detailed study on security tokens earlier this year. We'll be updating it into our real-time database and we've mapped the entire security token ecosystem and then are keeping an eye on the latest developments obviously uh um one of the most exciting being black manta and and robert's uh, platform is, is their latest offering um so um jürgen you've been busy as well so uh, highly excited to be here thank you very much and uh as we know that a lot of people are talking normally about doing security token offerings but i always say there are more people who talk than people who have done one so I'm really happy to have Florian here and uh, I would like to hand over the word to him. So Florian, you as a, how to say that, as a company, as a young company, what made you go down uh, the road of a security token offering? And in short, I think it would feel like hours. What are your key learnings out of it and uh, where you're standing now at the moment? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, what did us make us go the way down? It's basically, we have come from the cryptocurrency investment scene ourselves. Um, so kind of into this whole uh, tokenization stuff. And we just said, okay, someone has to be first. Someone has to do it. Um, it is a great instrument. If you want to get multiple investors on board, if you want to get private people on board, if you want to basically pass on all the VC stuff that you usually have to go through as a startup, where you get your investors in and then you have a uh, harsh regulations, harsh shareholder agreements. We said, we want to get, uh, you know, the small people in, we want to get our ambassadors out there. So we're going to go the way of a token offering. And at the time when we started, we were still in this ICO hype, but we soon realized that you need the regulated asset to actually you know, you have this trust level uh, that you want to get um, with the asset that you're giving out. So we decided to do this. Um, I think we have uh, quite a, a good um, uh, legal system in Austria to basically do it. So the FMA was, was really interested and helpful and stuff. Of course, they want to regulate, but they also want to understand and they don't want to deny you this opportunity. Still uh, learning is we thought it would get quicker done than um, it actually did. So we kind of got into a financial problem 
until really like issuing the token. So we had the LOIs signed, but getting the FMA approval took uh, a lot of time. So that's something you have to consider when, when doing uh, an STO that probably get a little bit of, you know, like a puffer time frame um, for all the legal um, stuff. Mm. But it was an instrument that made it possible for us to not only get, you know, the cryptocurrency investors, the people who got early into Bitcoin, Ethereum, we're trading on the, on the exchanges into this blockchain based assets, but also traditional investors who are into, you know, like uh, uh, assets, shares uh, and stuff, get them into the blockchain sphere, get them invested in tokens and give them basically um, the entrance into the whole crypto system. And we, we, we actually have seen that those people then got into Bitcoin as well. Um, starting with the tokenized asset that they were used to and that they knew. What we are still uh, missing in all of this is, of course, like the secondary market um, that yeah. you don't have. I mean, you have it via ICOs, uh, a lot of exchanges. It was, I mean, listing is always a, a hot topic, like paying for it, but we don't have the secondary market yet. So our inv investors have to be kind of patient um, with the asset. Um, we're lucky we got uh, those long-term holders and believers. But of course, uh, a public listing is something that will definitely, or like having the opportunity of a secondary market will definitely drive this forward. Thank you very much, uh, Florian, for that uh, good introduction. So Robert, uh, I think you didn't know Florian before. Is this things you are going through at the moment? Yeah, um, that's interesting. So um, he alluded to um, regulation, um, and, and the whole process of going through that. So for instance, um, in our case, like I said before, we've actually been going through the French AMF guidelines of regulation to actually meet you know, um, their, their approval. And um, it's very costly and it takes a lot of time and patience, but you learn through all of that. Of course, if you're bringing to market something that is authentic um, and has a very strong value proposition and the due diligence, you have to think about all of that if you're doing this sort of thing. So uh, there are pain points. And um, my advice would be that if you are using, whether you're doing a utility token sale or you're doing a security token, um, is to use platforms and partners that can help you all along the way to bring your product to market so that it is indeed a, legit, a legitimate, um, you know, um, sort of like asset. And um, so we've been very lucky in the sense that um, on one hand, for instance, the KYC and the AML, um, it, it's a nightmare. Uh, but we are working with Duff and Phelps, who are a legendary um, financial advisory. Um, they've been, they're a Wall Street company going all the way back to 1932. They're responsible, for instance, for a lot of those assets that you see on the New York Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange. So they've been working with us and they're helping us with all that KYC and AML, for instance, to actually meet approval. Our law firm as well, um, you know, they, they have been very instrumental. Um, I noticed that in this space, when I looked at the utility token space, all of those ICOs, um, none of, well, very few of them, if I'm correct, may have what is called a legal opinion. And a legal yeah. opinion is, is an unbiased document that actually helps through that due diligence process. So they've done that for us, as well as a, a lot of other things. So that's actually a process that um, I would suggest that anybody who wants to do this, you have to be prepared. And um, you, know, you have to um, understand that you, a, a, a huge budget will be required for that. But once you've gone through it, then um, I guess, um, you know, yeah, that, that's a good thing. So we're excited about this. So the next stage now for us is that what we wanted to do is, is, is that um, as we're building these eco the ecosystem that we're building of assets, we realized that there was an opportunity to bring in institutional investors or high net worth individuals and family offices. And we could do that through the security token offering of the company, okay? And then that will then give these investors an opportunity to not only have equity, a stake in the company through the security token, but also have 
um, exits through an exchange such as Archax that we're very excited about, which will be one of the first in the UK going through FCA regulation yeah. as well. So everything is regulation, 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 which indeed is what we actually need in this industry. So all that's going to be very, very exciting. And then of course, they would also get to participate in the tokenization of the platforms that we are developing. So like Blockerbase is a search engine. Um, it's, it's actually, it's the first kind of, tokenized search engine if you go to blockerbase.com you can actually add urls so unlike google we allow you to actually add those urls to power up the utility and by so doing you participate in the token which is the dna of the platform and then that gets listed on a crypto exchange and then that provides value and therefore you're part of that utility so th those are the kinds of things that we're doing thank you very much uh, Robert and Sorcha, we talk now about startups, and uh, I think you have a different view or thoughts about it because it's a little bit different than a traditional startup if you talk about SMEs, for example. <clears throat> Yeah, so when we talk about SMEs, I guess we want to bring them to the table when this is a complete in-the-box, ready-to-click-and-go type product. Um, there'll only be a few that will engage at early stage and be at the table. And there are a few of them because they've reached out to me over the last few months looking for exactly this. Because traditional finance project products for um, established SMEs who have been unable to access government grants through COVID-19 um, and have not been able to access sufficient finance for over a decade of their manufacturing life cycle, um, or indeed if they're a distributions and exporting company. And they're now coming to me and saying, well, how do I get involved? What do I need to do? When will this be ready for me to use? So that's really positive. Um, but at the same time, we need to take the necessary precautions. We need sandboxes um, and we need the regulators to be involved in the conversation. And I'm so happy to hear, Robert, that uh, Duff and Phelps are involved in the process because their valuations expertise is second to none. Um, so I find that really inspiring to hear. Now, I can't imagine the fees are cheap, but certainly the expertise <laughs> is worth it. <laughs> Yeah, yes, um, and indeed, um, like the likes of what Black Manta have done um, in the STO raise for the property funds during um, COVID-19. I mean, Brian and Christian um, and, and the team here, uh, it was so inspiring to see during the worst times of COVID when people couldn't access funding that a 12 million STO was hitting the headlines. And so that's inspired other clients of mine in the blockchain space who, this is why I say STO and what, blockchain and what, um, STO and um, an organics platform that is solving SDG 12, which is um, uh, to do with uh, uh, sustainable production and consumption of organic food. Um, and that's for Ireland because we've only got 2% of our 25% uh, achievement uh, ratio, which is worth over 200 million at 202%. So we need to unlock more of that money. Um, and then with an, uh, the organics platform, they're looking to raise capital um, for a property. And they're looking to do that through an STO. So it's what plus what rather than one particular technology on its own. Mm -hmm. And then what are the other opportunities that um, raising an STO and using the likes of Dutton Phelps and Black Manta's expertise and the other advisors will contribute towards global reporting standards and ISOs and organic certification. Um, what is the programmability further up the chain to make sure that um, SMEs are included in the wider marketplace and not just financial services? Um, and also then, how do we bring that to micro SMEs who wouldn't have the same affordability as a two million plus turnover or revenue organization. So it's making it much more inclusive um, is, is where I'm looking at the intersection really. But so, so, so you're you dreaming guys are of taking the risk, you're, you're doing the first stage of it for us. So you're dreaming of a world where even like a small company is able to do it very efficiently as security token offering. 
it should be a public service and honesty. Uh, your inclusion into um, into into technology for global reporting standards, accounting standards, so that you can access finance yeah. in the yeah. click of a button. That should be standardised as a public service. But what's the first step to get us there? So, so you're dreaming of a completely as a you know like a Utopia, Jurgen. It's it's perfect. It's perfect. You know, we, we need to shoot to the moon. Uh, so Mars, I'm happy if we land on moon. We got to start Toby. the conversation. Toby, yeah. what's your take on it? Because I think you are on on a, the you have this perspective of the traditional market. Is it something which people are seeing coming? Is it which uh, you know, like you work with yeah. funds, you help them. Is it things which they are looking into, or is it still something which is? Uh, for the crazy ones which want to make a better world or change the world. Crazy! <laughs> no, sorry. Thanks, Jürgen. <laughs> so, crazy are in a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The crazy swatches uh, of the this crazy world, ones in the know, sense of uh, Apple. You know? <laughs> um, crowdfunding on steroids, but the I think I think the yeah I think I think looking from a sort of traditional finance perspective, we've actually been presenting um, to one of the biggest broker dealers in the UK city, and they had seven executives to come in and talk about security tokens. So it was quite intriguing. Um, I think, like a lot of these organizations, they're very much in the educational phase, so so really um, I think, I think you'll find a lot of financial services firms, what they're doing is, is they, they've, they've caught the Bitcoin bug. I think, I think it's, it's pretty clear. Um, they're generally fairly skeptical about crypto assets generally. And the, the, the second area that they're probably most excited about from a traditional financial services group is, um, is, is security tokens actually. So one of the problems for security tokens, however, is um, there just really isn't that much activity. So the, what, what you're finding, I think, is that the, 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 the traditional um, crypto VCs hedge funds, if you can call them that, um, the likes of Pantera, um, Union Square and Dress, and they're typically actually trading the unregulated token market at the moment, mm, yeah. just because there isn't a clear regulation of the security token market. But I think yeah. everyone's waiting for people like Robert and Florian and enough test cases to push the boundaries that um, the floodgates could definitely open once there's a bit more certainty and legal clarity. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex, uh, I want to ask you a question. So we had uh, in Europe, like yesterday, a very, how to say that, interesting press release from a company which was known to be on the forefront in this area as well. And uh, the company is uh in Germany, which are kind of saying the governments are slowly on the road. Uh, how do you see it? Because I think the the, the press release there was a little bit controversial what 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 the Mantis experience was or is so how do you see this and uh, a second question like you were seeing like like Florian he was self issuing uh, the security tokens and he was mentioning one of his biggest problem was like okay uh, how do I get this listed and uh, I have already money on one side so how does someone like uh, Black Manta fits the in as well in the ecosystem. Yes. Uh, so first of all, uh, we were very surprised when reading yesterday's news that uh, Neufund uh, is pulling out of the market. They were one of the first in the tokenization space in Europe. Yeah. Uh, the first probably in Germany, I assume. They were actually they founded one and a half years before we even thought about Black Manta. And they raised quite a lot of money last year. And uh, yesterday they announced, so actually, I cannot comment in detail because I only have the public information available, yeah. so background information on this, but they, they kind of uh, said they're pulling out of the market and blame BaFin because the regulator is not innovative enough and they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And this, is a, this was also a bit, so we couldn't agree with this because BaFin gave us a license uh, last year. The Berlin real estate token, we, uh, which started in April, 
was fully approved by BAF and it was a retail offering, exactly what Neu von Rosen wanted to do. So Baffin did this all with us. So I don't, do not understand where the problems with Neufund, uh, mm. where the, the problem was. Um, but it, what is for sure, it's a, it's a pity that they are, they're gone or for now at least. And let's see what, what the impact on the market will be in Germany. And especially the regulator now, it's not only Neufund is blaming them, but the, Baffin has also other issues with Wirecard. So we discussed it yesterday shortly. Um, <laughs> So let's see how the regulator in Germany will come out of this uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, our experience with them was very good. Um, that's what I can say. To the other question, um, what was the other question actually? The other question was basically, you know, like uh, someone like Florian, he was self-issuing and uh, yeah. versus like Black Manta is like, okay, you know, if you're self-issue, you have a lot of, how to say that hoops and loops you need to jump because like as Florian said on one way you have signed LOIs and on the other way you're still waiting for that you're getting uh, how to say that the, the, the green light from the regulator so what is the, your experience in, in this way so, so is Black Manta like how is it positioned in this ecosystem? There? What Florian did and Florian was the first with Blockbit in, in Austria and there were a few others in Europe or around the world what most of them did is they built their own, let's call it investment plan themselves. So they needed to have AML, in, uh, AML and KYC implemented, the whole tokenization platform coming from them. So this is very impressive actually that they did that. And I can imagine this is, very, or actually I know, this is very cost intense and uh, yeah, it takes a lot of time to have this build up. So what we are now doing, um, for example, also with blockchain company and Robert, um, we provide our clients or the issuer with the whole technical infrastructure and the regulatory framework around it. So we make sure that the offering is compliant in the jurisdictions they want to have the offering in. And we provide them with the whole uh, investment process uh, compliant to European capital market laws. Mm -hmm. so, so, so for my understanding is that, like, you know, like uh, as a North Florence project as well, very well. Uh, I think the advantage here was that uh, the company itself was a tech company, but I was seeing like uh, with a project like a real estate offering, I think it's very hard to, how to explain that, uh, for them to, to do something like this because their expertise is not like in technology. Do you, how do you see this in terms of projects which would like to onboard with Black Manta? Is there some similarities in this? Yes. So first of all, fundraising per se is, very difficult and time consuming, not only for startups, for SMEs, for, for, for everyone. So you yeah. need to focus on it. If you then have also to build your own investment platform, you know, it takes a lot of time. And therefore we say, okay, issues should focus on their main business and mm. probably the fundraising activities reaching out to the network, but they shouldn't care about what's, what's the technical solution or the regulatory framework behind it. So, mm. and that's the pain we want to take from the issues. They come to us, we, we, we want to be the first, we want to be the one-stop shop when it comes to tokenization. And maybe I can add here something. I mean, I would have been so happy to have Black Manta at the time when we did the issuance because we basically did a lot of these things manually. So KYC checks, like personally with the investors. I mean, we didn't do a public offering in that sense. We did a kind of a private offering for around 50 to 60 investors. Um, if we would have had to do the public offering, like you do it with a real estate token, real estate token right now, there would have been a lot of more costs like incurring to really have this automated platform for us it was uh, because we were so early and there was not not such a thing it was only the only way to do it privately because publicly we would have had a hard time to really get to the investors and automate all the processes mm -hmm. may, may i ask uh, sorge because sorge you were uh, kind of going into this discussion okay i want to 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 uh, make this uh, fundraising instrument available to everyone, do you think something like, you know, how do you see it? Like, for me, it's like a little bit like YouTube. You know, everyone can make a video. So <laughs> it's great that everyone can make a video, but it doesn't mean that everyone has a lot of views. And yeah. how do you think this, if I'm saying like, uh, let's, everyone can make an STO, but what's the purpose of it if you not have your attention? So how do you see this, something like this could work with the SME, you know, if I'm a, hairdresser, my expertise is in hairdressing and it's not in how I'm selling my company financing. 
social capital has a different way to present itself in, in when it's digitized. And we don't have a way to put metrics on it at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. We bundle in social capital and human capital um, with uh, human resources uh, in management rather than um, it being a tangible, visible uh, experience as well as uh, a value driver for small businesses. So say in the use of, of, of COVID, for example, if you were to go down your local city, town, village, um, high street or um, business area, and you, you realize that your um, local florist was no longer there, your local butcher, baker, your favorite cafe, um, that weird place that has that sign outside every day that you don't know what it's going to say tomorrow, but it's no longer there and you don't know what it ever did, but they're gone because yeah. there was yeah. funding available to them during COVID. But what they had access to were micropayment opportunities to get prepayments or coupons or vouchers from their valuable audience of mm -hmm. um, clients that bought into them, their consumers. And, you know, the, the platform didn't really exist during COVID. We saw in Ireland, I, I know, and in the UK on various task forces that I was present on, um, that there were platforms that were put together very quickly, a website where people could buy coupons in advance. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's a one-stop shop let's say, what's the future opportunity for that and what's the programmability of it? So that's one part of it. But I think a major part that needs to be focused, and I've been drilling it into each of you, is that the EU action plan and um, European Commission action plan uh, closes, the sur survey closes this Friday, and the crypto community and the blockchain community have not been contributing too much. Okay? So we need to get ourselves in the five-year plan so that we're creating the environment that we can operate in. And this includes sustainability as well, by the way, because we have to be practical about the amount of energy that's going to be required to uh, make data centers operate so that we can all um, trade digitally um, and build digitally over the next few years. So I'm going to send that out, um, or get, Jürgen, if you wouldn't mind saying to get out to the audience and the I'm happy if you put it up in the chat and we can uh, put it in then in the follow-up email. But I, I don't know if it's going out. Fantastic. To or, yeah. So f feel free to put it in the chat because then everyone can see it and uh, can follow up. And there are handful, like a couple of handful of people which definitely I think uh, would be interesting to support that as well. Great. Um, I, I actually wanted to just lend a couple of thoughts to what Sochi was just saying there. Um, in terms of how small companies, SMEs, um, you know, get involved here in this whole new paradigm of security tokens. Um, and what we actually would like to do is, is that because of the experience that we've actually gone through working with regulators, particularly mm -hmm. the French um, SEC AMF, as I said, um, what I can share with you is, is that, so we had a panel meeting with them, like, you know, you can imagine one of those Senate hearings, so it was like that, it was like nine of them there, and, and there was five of us with our lawyer on the other side <laughs> of the Paris. and it was, it was a very interesting experience for me for the first time, as it were, but what I found was, is that, uh, what we found was, is that they were actually quite eager to actually um, have the opportunity to meet with people like ourselves, who they felt that may be doing something quite tangible in this space. And then another thing that I observed was, was that it was also a learning process for them because this whole paradigm of utility tokens, STOs, is all quite new. Now, here's what they said to us. They said that um, when they um, look at what it is that we're doing, they would either be able to determine whether we are a utility token. This was for um, the, the one of the projects that we're doing called Blockchain Valley, um, whether that would be a utility token or a security token. What they said is that either way, we would simply just need to follow the rules. So if it was a security token, we would need, there's a certain set of rules for that. If it's a utility token, then that works with the framework that they're designing now. So obviously they see some upside there. Now, what we want to do is, is that um, going forward after we pass through all of this is to, to be able to share that process with you know, the hairdressers that you talk about, for instance, you know, or, or the shop around the corner um, or, or whatever, you know, startups that want to come to market. 
um, and, and to make it easier for them because there really is a lot of red tape. There's a lot of bureaucracy. So because we've been working with a variety of partners, you know, your, your smart contracts, your lawyers, you know, your, your Duff and Phelps and so on, there probably is a way where we can put all of that together and then when people come along and they want to do a security token or a utility token, and as long as they are willing to follow the guidelines, then, the, then it should be a lot easier by sharing that experience with them and making the introductions that they would need in order to get their deals done. And I think that that's, that's a very nice, uh, like, like uh, Toby, a uh, question to you, because you are a research company. So how do you imagine the world like in 10 years uh, because you're a data research company on uh, basically collect data and companies. So do you would expect to have them on each, don't get me wrong now, hairdresser and butcher, uh, which has a certain size uh, data on? Or, or is these are companies which are too small? Because how do you see that in that reflection? Well, I guess any, any business um, that can have a business model that can can generate the returns, right? I think um, one of the major drivers of, of the security token, if you think about it, is actually excessive regulation that sort of choked off the public markets from listing, right? So I think we saw um, the big sort of funding boom in 2017 when there was basically a sort of brief hiatus when, when startups kind of hoped there was a regulatory free-for-all. And um, a lot of the token market just dashed for cash and more than $10 billion was raised at that time. Um, but I think that the, the, the it, it is really desirable that the profits made in a Facebook or an Uber or any of these things the retail investor is able to participate earlier in the process, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, to, to date, a lot of the biggest companies, and what was great about the ICO market, what was great about Bitcoin, what was great about Ethereum, is a lot of those returns accrued to retail investors. I think the, it's probably a bit of a distraction thinking about a mum and pop um, thing, um, being fully tokenized. I think, I think you might be able to increase family and friends financing and all of that and yeah. provide a bit more liquidity in that way. Um, we've actually looked at, there's a, there's a group that's sort of looking into digitizing cap tables in the UK, a group called Globacap. And we, we just, for, for the interest in it, they run a SaaS model where you can get your cap table um, completely put in a digital structure and it's very easy to be transparent and then transfer shares from one sort of person to another without going all hog like Robert and going to how do we make this thing tradable as mm. still a relatively young company. Um, so I think, I think that definitely would be exciting for, for possibly a hairdresser, at least a sort of local business with, 200k in revenue, 500k in revenue. Um, it's uh, as 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 businesses become tradable. I think. I think, and I think we will definitely see um, security tokens, utility tokens, DeFi instruments that are commonly traded, and and the sort of market cap in in crypto over multi trillion dollars, kind of thing. Oh, okay, uh, I would like to, 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 to reframe that a little bit uh, back to uh, Florian. So Florian, like from your perspective, uh, because you know, these are all things which we talk all about what's, what is and what is there, because you go on through this process and also to everyone is discussing the secondary market problem. But I think, uh, how is your opinion on it? Because what you were issuing is a revenue participation note. Is it expected uh, from those people who invested that they are also to having like a stock market form to be able to trade this? Or is it something like, you know, if I'm investing in a property, I want a recurring revenue going on. I'm not interested in flipping the property, for example. So, so what is there, your experience uh, which you had so far? Because, you know, I think secondary market is good, but we all know 
small cap secondary markets are existing and they're non-liquid. So do we need to think about different forms of liquidity, for example? Well, yeah, I think, I mean, it's definitely expected to provide some form of liquidity at the point in time. Um, and in our case, I'm pretty sure the investors knew that this is not going to happen in the next two or three years. Um, so we are lucky on that, that there are, you know, long-term perspective. But I think that everybody wants to, you know, like be able to liquidate those assets in, in terms of need. And of course, it depends on the investor, but especially when you want to attract this new kind of uh, small cap investors, they want to have uh, liquid assets. And yeah, we talked about this yesterday, but if you say, okay, there could be a market like you know it from the stock exchanges or from your utility coins, there could also be other forms of liquidity that you can provide by taking, for example, and, and you mentioned this yesterday and I like the idea, those assets as collateral for a loan, for example, so that you could provide another form of liquidity, not directly by trading them, but basically allowing these assets which have value to be used as collateral. Um, this is something that you should totally uh, look into it because I don't think that, um, especially when you see you know, the EU um, um, region will offer a secondary market very, very soon. A lot of exchanges like Börse Stuttgart or, or Block Trade in Liechtenstein, they're talking about this for years now. Their plans were 2019, now they're 20, 2020, uh, 2020, now they're talking about 2021. And it's really something that you can't predict because it's just up to the regulators at this point of time. Mm -hmm. I would like to add something here. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to secondary markets, there are two forms of secondary market, either peer-to-peer, or regulated exchanges. There are some exchanges now uh, popping up, popping up uh, Florent just mentioned the two, but also like Archex in London, where uh, Robert's token, watching company token, will be, will be listed after the, the token offering. Um, we believe that not for every token a second uh, uh, exchange makes sense, because you won't, you won't have the liquidity and the market won't be there. And it really depends on the asset class. And like, for, for example, real estate. Uh, listed real estate token doesn't make sense. You don't have any, you don't have any volatility. You have probably uh, annual or semi-annual valuations of the property. It's important to have a market where you can uh, buy and sell uh, these tokens, but you don't need a, a regulated exchange like Börse Stuttgart, what, what you just mentioned. So it depends on the asset. And we believe that also a lot of issuers don't want to have the tokens listed uh, which on an exchange, which means external uh, pricing on these tokens. Mm -hmm. um, and I think these are also reasons why, and Florian, you're totally right. Uh, and we were in Malta for two, one and a half years now and they talked and talked and talked and nothing happened at all. And a lot of exchanges do that. and. I think these are one of the reasons because not for every asset class and for every stage, uh, a company stage, it makes sense to list a token or have a secondary market. Yeah, I think um, you mentioned it. It doesn't need an exchange and you probably won't get the liquidity that an exchange would find attractive to list an asset, especially when you go into the startup scene and stuff like this. But what you would need is this place to buy and sell like a out of a broker. I mean, we see it in our, with our token. There has been secondary market activity, people like trading peer to peer. We know it because we have to whitelist and KYC the recipient of the tokens. So there definitely is a need and could be just like liquidity need or just uh, people want to sell this or people want to get into the company and there's STO is always so the only option is to buy it on the secondary market. But right now they all come to me, right? So I'm the issuer. If someone wants to sell, they ask me, do you know someone who wants to buy? So a kind of a, an eBay for STO uh, is something that, that could be a, an idea. I think it's, of course, regulatory wise, uh, it could be a problem, but this is something that's definitely needed. Can I jump in there for a minute? Um, because um, we actually have um, a, you know, a, a pragmatic solution here. Well, 
we're actually going through that. So with blocker base, for instance, I'll use that. So that's a search engine, a tokenized search engine where, you know, you add those URLs, you make the comments, you vote the URLs up and so on, and you get tokens all the way. The, what we've done, which is what um, Florian and um, Alex just alluded to, that sometimes you don't essentially have to go to the exchange right away. If you are building a utility that is going to scale, and it has that you know, potential, then what you want to really do is you want to be patient with that. You want to use growth marketing strategies to grow your utility. So what we're doing is, is that we're rewarding the users by proxy the token. So in the case of blocker base, so the token is called base. So say Sasha adds um, X number of URLs and so on. She gets to own those URLs. She gets tokens for that. She makes comments. She does likes. She does shares. She gets tokens for that. Now, so if you think about it, say a year from now, we we built up what you might call critical mass, or you've actually got to a stage where it's now meaningful. You might even have some revenue streams going on. By the way, the people, the users of the platform can also potentially trade P2P. They can exchange those tokens. Now, and then you've done your PR. You've got to do all these things correctly. Okay. So you've got to give it time and patience. So once you've done that, then guess what? By the time you take that token to a crypto exchange, it has a lot of pent up value because you can actually see, you know, um, you can see the robustness of the platform. You can see the traffic flow that's coming through. You can see the scalability and it all just begins to make fine. And probably if there's some revenue already, then by the time it gets to that token. So the point here is, is that yes, indeed, you don't always have to go straight to an exchange. Sometimes that's probably not the best idea to actually do it. So what I'm saying is that you might want to build in, focus on building the platform, you know, evolving the platform, getting the users in, uh, involved, reward them through proxy with the token and then go to market. So There's some social Robert capital Mayer. metrics in there that could be applied and monitored and that critical mass in a year's time will have real value that isn't quantified at this point in time. So I'd really love to learn a little bit more about that. Can, yeah, can I add right. a little bit, Jürgen, or am I stepping out of turn? No, no, I just wanted to ask uh, Robert that he's clarifying basically he's doing, doing two different things. In one way, he's doing an STO, but he's also to trying to do a utility token offering, uh, which I find interesting. And maybe he can give us like very short an idea why do you separate those two parts basically? Uh, actually, um, it, we, it, it wasn't intended to actually separate them. Um, it just began to make financial sense. So what we did, as I said, when we first when we raised our funding of two point five million, um, you know, I mean, here's what we said to the SEC in France when we said, um, with respect to that, um, you know, pr project that we're trying to do an ICO for, we said that listen, if we're going to compete with our American friends, we have to think in a very big way. And so therefore we have to take this product to the market in such a way that the retailers, the consumers, the 7.5 billion people can get involved. If you want to build the next Google, the next Amazon, that's the way you have to think, right? So we just focused on just building the platform, yeah? So if you look at Blockerbase, that's an MVP. If you look at Blockchain Valley, even though you can't use it, uh, you can play with it, but the token, the 4IR token doesn't work because of course we haven't got the approval yet. We're, we're very close to it, right? Now, my point is, is, is that, um, so it wasn't intended that we'll separate the two, but because we've already built value through the MVP, yeah, which you can see, and the users are beginning to use blocker base already, for instance, and, and another uh, um, asset that we have called Big Street. Therefore, it made sense that we can actually offer institutional investors, high net worth investors or family offices, an opportunity to get in um, on the security token, which is equity, in the same way you would go to, the, to a venture capital, yeah? Give them that opportunity. And then if they come in now with that, when we now do the utility token sales, guess what? They participate on a pro rata basis from what we retain in the in this, um, utility token. So they're getting two for one, literally. And our focus is to just build mass. So with the money that we raise, you know, we want to really go big. And that's basically the point. So it wasn't intended, but it just made financial sense. To so actually. basically, for my understanding, is like for the holding structure, is more like for the whole picture, you are focusing uh, through the STO. 
And then like all the products you're launching, you're trying to build it in a way that they're incentivized uh, engine into integrated, which is then a utility token. That's correct. Um, most of what we build are incentivized. We, we um, in fact, actually, we use, a, we have a research team, a token economist research team that goes out there and they look at the addressable markets. They look at all the pain points that we do the valuation, you know, uh, uh, what kind of market are we trying to target? What does it look like? And so on. Then we look for incentivize, how to incentivize the platform. With blockchain value as an example, um, for instance, when you, so blockchain value would work like, like um, Amazon, but focused on fourth industrial revolution technologies, your IoT, your 3D printing, your nanotechnology, all of those kinds of things. Now, you can, so you can buy those services over the platform once the token starts to work. However, let's suppose that, you know, you're going to buy some IoT device and he, he has that at home. But guess what? That IoT device is collecting data that you don't know it's collecting that data about you. You should all know about the fangs now. They're collecting all our data. We're not getting anything. So what we've done is we've built in a feedback loop that says that, look, if you're collecting this data and you haven't told this consumer, well, why don't you on a voluntarily basis share that with Jorgen? So Jorgen will see all that data in his account on Blockchain Valley. Guess what? He can monetize that data through the token. And every time he purchases something on the, on, on the platform, he gets for IR. He gets rewarded for that. So what you have to do here is, is that whether you are a hairdresser or whether you are a platform, you simply need to sit down take a step back and look at just like loyalty points you have to look for how how do you unlock value by incentivizing your consumers or your user base because they help you power up the platform that's what's the problem with google facebook and um whatever uh, amazon you know they've taken all our data we've made them very wealthy but we get nothing and they monetize us but what we're doing here, a blockchain company, is we're going to turn it around and in 10 years from now, we want to be the next Google in a more democratic, tokenized world. And that's it. <laughs> Marta, your slot. <laughs> in a nutshell, a system within a system of systems a solution. That's fantastic. Uh, I think I'm subscribing after this. Um, I think the whole point of blockchain and STOs and every vehicle that we're discussing now is to change the culture of investing that exists today. And VC was mentioned earlier on. Like that's a military style investment vehicle designed to compete fast and break things for war so that you could compete in war. So the culture of investing for a segment of the market needs to change and that is for technology companies today because every t every company in some capacity will be digitized there will be very few that will not be so they're all technology companies but they're not all built for the vc type model and they're not all built for traditional um, fundraising uh, vehicles so we need to be looking at one segment of the market that is long horizon that is lifetime lifestyle investments and, and equity raising and capital raising. So that's um, continuous token, a token offering, which I really, which I heard about recently. How can we use SDOs in that capacity to complement the long-term horizon? And how can we bring in a new safe haven asset class, as uh, Alex mentioned earlier, asset class of ESGs, uh, environmental, social, and government investments? Um, which yeah. include institutional investors, which are also pension funds. And how can we use those on STOs to fund small community projects as well as global community projects in a diversified portfolio manager um, management perspective? So these are the opportunities that I see for STOs. There's a, a, a roadmap route to go, but it's planting the seed now so that people are beginning to build. Because if we continue in a five-year roadmap with the EU action plan I mentioned earlier, the traditional finance sector have already completed their applications. They're done and dusted. Now it's our time. We need to come in and make sure that the... the, the the uh, technology that we want included in the next five-year plan is being discussed and written into policy so that we can participate and build. Mm -hmm. for, for me, it's like, like uh, I would like to, 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 because we were getting at the moment a lot of questions in one direction, and the direction is like a little bit uh, going in, in a different area. So I would like to, 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 to address here, Alex, 
like people are asking like you know yes uh, i want to do an sto but then it's this problem okay legally where can i even do it because you know there's this issue with passporting uh can i sell it in the in the us uh, stuff like this so could you give us a little bit of an overview because i think that would answer like a couple of questions which were all in the similar things and like i mean there's some general questions uh what's the cost and you know sto alone is the thing what people need to understand and uh, i maybe would like to answer that the fact of doing an sto is like how do you issue it it's not about how you sell it the selling is still basically as florence said in the beginning the same is like it may offers or there's a window of opportunity where some investors lend you an ear because you're doing something uh, outside the traditional frame set but in the in, in the long term it's it, it's it's as i said it's not like just putting it up on some platform and magically money is coming i think that's what what needs to be understand and if you to be honest it, it's always like very sad to say if you really have like zero funds available then the first option to get funds going is also the most likely not the sto it's like if you believe in your idea you need to bootstrap your capital first i don't know fifty thousand us dollars to to be able to go to the next level it's like you know if you want to go to a mountain you cannot climb immediately the highest mountain you need to first pass through smaller ones so back to alex so how do you see this from a legal perspective selling securities in a fully regulated market because you know what are the problems there and, and, and how someone like Black Manta is solving this in a, in a very profound way? So first of all, you're totally right. Uh, tokenization is not a magical weapon. And now all, all startups or SMEs are getting funding now. Um, it still depends on the underlying asset. And if you have a shit startup, sorry, to, you won't, tokenization won't help you. Um, it's just a new, a new form of, an, of um, Let's call it probably crowd investing because you're um, reaching out to a bigger crowd, to a public crowd, um, but you can also do just a private placement like for our bit. We just have a new form of um, funding vehicle. Um, to the, on a legal perspective, uh, the European capital market is very fragmented. We have European capital market rules, but in the end, as it is now, each member state uh, can do his own regulations within this framework. That's why if we look, especially for startups, this crowdfunding regulation, where we have on the European level, up to 8 million you can raise uh, without uh, the need of a capital market perspective. In the end, we have in each uh, jurisdiction other regulations, like in Austria, it's 2 million. In, in Germany, it's up to 8 million. Uh, I think in Ireland, it's 2.5, I don't know. Um, so what, and the first security open offering we did in Berlin, we were below the 2 million threshold and we offered it in Austria and Germany only, uh, talking to both of the regulators. And if you don't have a capital market prospectus, which you can passport to each member state via notification, then you indeed need to talk to every regulator in the European Union and file any form what is necessary there. Um, that's why we hope that the new, there's a new crowdfunding regulation uh, was published uh, a few weeks ago, um, coming to force, I don't know, or hopefully uh, next year, um, where the thresholds are increased to 5 million and where they want to uh, enable startups or issuer to raise money in the single European market with only one one counterparty and that, that will be any governmental entity i don't know and without having this hassle of passporting or the need of a capital market perspective um on the uh, other hand sorry just one sentence what is yeah, no very important and um that's why we also understand the frustration Neufront has with, with the regulatory framework but in the end all these legal requirements are for one purpose and that's this is investor protection and especially if you're targeting retail investors and they can invest with 500, they are not professionals. So that's why you need to inform them what are the risks involved, uh, you know, what can happen also from a tax perspective. And this is very important. That's why we have such regulations in Europe. And 
it, it, it costs some money, yeah, but um, tokenization won't, won't help you and won't change that. How do you think, like, like this is like, a, you know, if I'm interested in uh, doing an STO, where do you think it makes sense? Does it make sense if I want to securitize $200,000 or is it something which needs to be $50 million? Well, when it comes to startups and SMEs, uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, do very early stage startups because, um, and this was one of the other questions, there's a lot of marketing effort. If you are no name, you need to put a lot of money into marketing. That's why if you're a B2C company, you are already in the market, you have your customer base, then you could, can do this uh, going public via tokenization, then it makes sense. Um, also raising 200,000, 500,000, I think then you, you should stick to the old system, business angels, family and friends, probably uh, early stage VCs. There are certain costs involved with tokenization, and that's why we say, okay, at least two million something like this, then it makes sense. Uh, I think you need to add to so, so if you start even with angel investors, you can convert them later on as well, like in the, into into security token holders. Yeah, actually, so that's what um, one that was one of the strategies uh, Blockbit and Florin had, uh, combining the security token offering with existing and uh, future uh, business angels. Yeah. Thank you very much because you know it, it's already like five. I would like to make one round and kind of from everyone like here like a very short connotation maybe in five to ten words how they're seeing all of this is looking like in let's say four years. Uh, Toby, I would like to start this time with you. And uh, yeah, mate. so so there's a very good question on on what's the difference between VCs and securities. Um, and I think that the big disruption, it will be the sort of crowdfunding style disruption over a five year time frame, where the liquidity is coming, and people can begin to trade, I don't know, a Monzo that raised money in crowdfunding, in theory, that should be tokenized and tradable. Um, you should have been able to be able to trade an Uber token uh, earlier on. That kind of thing, I really envisage, will be happening in a much bigger scale. And, and the battles that Black Manta and the like are doing is, is really valuable for that. Lauren, you next. Well, I hope in four to five years, uh, everybody has the chance to like quickly and uncomplicated via smartphone add some tokenized asset to his belongings. That's what I would wish for. So, so you basically, you imagine something like uh, I can buy security tokens for something like Revolut and trade it there or something like this? Yeah, like, like in my online e-banking account or be it like, uh, you know, an exchange like Bitpanda or whatever, making it possible for me yeah. to just, like, quickly invest into those kind of assets, be it uh, regular stocks that are just like denominated and make it possible to invest with one euro or be it like startups from your region uh, where yeah. you want to put your money into. So basically uh, more, more like localization uh, of investing and also like, like I think Sorcha, like you have a very strong opinion on this as well, like, uh, to reactivate more like this communal local behavior so how would you imagine it this in a I think similar way than uh, Florian is in your way, how would you formulate it? Uh, well, first of all, I will be an investor in both Florian and Robert's platform via Black Manta, advised by Toby. That's the utopia over the next four or five years. And everybody has contributed, of course, to the EU fin uh, FinTech Action Plan. Um, and that more people are building products for micro businesses and the micro economy and not just the top tier of the economy because we've given them that respect. They've earned that respect over the last few months. Um, so let's not yeah. lose that. And we're more sustainably focused. We're achieving Agenda 2030 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Perfect. Robert? Yeah, um, so I would tend to agree with um, everybody here, <laughs> you know, Toby, um, what he said there in Florin. Um, the way I see it, I would think that by 2025, certainly by 2030, I would expect, just like the internet, 
that paradigm that now in this paradigm, I would imagine that maybe up to 30% of the economy is somewhat tokenized. So all those Silicon Valley assets that you see, I mean, imagine tender, you know, tokenizing, um, it makes sense because um you know right now people are talking about universal basic income you know in this whole covid thing whatever but um universal basic income yeah, to, to a certain degree that would work but i think tokenization give people who are powering up the utility the platforms give them a stake in it through the token and i think that that will begin to become common sense and the work that you're doing black manta archax all of that begins to make so much sense it's a runway thank you very much and for the closing word i would like to hand the word again to alex <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, also, thank you um, for participating. Um, we all know what the benefits of tokenizations are. Um, and we strongly believe, and I think I can speak for all of us, that these tokenized securities will be a central uh, component of tomorrow's capital market. And yeah, we are just at the beginning. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Uh, we will uh, have, a, I think in two weeks is the next one. Uh, we will inform you about it. Uh, the topic will be a little bit different than this time, but uh, thanks as well to all the panelists. I think we had like uh, people who have done something in the startup scene, people who are doing it actually, people who are like coming from more traditional background. So I think it was a very good, uh, how to say that, like mixture of uh, opinions. And uh, I'm wishing you like a, how to say that, a nice afternoon and uh, see you next time. Thank you very Thank much. You. Everyone can say bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Good moving you again. Um.